Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. And I was in awe of what he was doing, and I just thought thought it was fantastic. And of course, at that time, you know, that was when you know, years up. That was when the Karate Kid movie came out. I was just enthralled by it. Um, found out where he was training, and I decided to go up there one night, and I sat at the back back of the class, and um, I remember just thinking to myself, "This is exactly what I needed. This was this was, this was structure and discipline, and this was the right kind of." You know, everyone was getting yelled at, but to me, it was it, it wasn't abusive. It wasn't um, detrimental to your mental health. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was guidance. And I remember the way that they. I remember the way that the teacher spoke at the end of class, the way that he addressed people and rewarded them for the hard work they put in. It was that was something I'd never had before. It was something I, that I'd never seen. I, I didn't know that that existed. Yeah, of course. I mean, you totally see uh, from from the discussion today, we can totally see why it was martial arts and it wasn't something else. It can offer you role models. It can offer you that um, the role model. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's any females there, but I can certainly imagine why you would have a, um, be connected and drawn to the role model of the male in that scenario. The structure, the discipline, the uh, but the defensive side of things as well, being able to protect, even if you never physically use it to your advantage, just the 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 safety that it brings to the mind and able to but just protect with that physicality that it brings to the game i can totally see i'm, I'm sure we can all see why you went down that that path um but again your story goes a lot deeper right you you, you you've joined the club uh, and it's yep. offered you purpose in life now yeah. where what made you stick with it and not go well this is a hobby and i'll just go and get a normal job I think because it was mine, mm. it was something that I chose for for, for myself. Mm. Um, so the way the way things happened then was, of course, my parents were dead broke. Um, I remember after I'd been up there, I managed to convince my mum after badgering the hell out of her to get on the phone and ring them. Um, all I remember was that it was in Grovedale, it was at the parlor, public hall, and that was all I could re remember at the time. And so my mother had jumped on the phone. She, I think she rang some headquarters somewhere and then they said, yeah, look, we've got a do dojo in Geelong, we'll give, give you this guy's name and phone number. So uh, she called him up and he said, yep, no worries at all, bring him up and we'll let him jump into the class. He said, but we don't have any kids in there, so he'll be the only kid. How old are you at this point? 13. All oh, right, yes. Okay, still relatively yeah. quite young. Because everything's happened so much. I'm, I'm With the experience that you've had, I'm thinking, oh, you're 18, you're 20, you're 21. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because there's so, been yeah. so much that's gone on in this such short life. Okay, so you're 13 mm -hmm. years old. All right, sorry, yeah. go on. Uh, 13 years old. Uh, now, my mother's idea of uh, taking me up to do something was get on your bike, and then ride right up there. And I, I don't know if you know the distances, you, you probably do, but I was in Belmont. This mm. place was in Grovedale. Mm. So if you're driving your car, it's maybe a 10-minute drive. Yep. Um, but, of course, I was on my push bike, so it was about 45 minutes to an hour to ride up there. So I'd ride up Bailey Street, um, and it was pretty much a goat track back then, and half of it was a dirt road. So by the time I got up there, you know, I'd have to leave – Home at the class start. I remember class started at six thirty. I would leave at five, and I'd be up there at six, and I'd be waiting for him. Um, got led into the class. Uh, he kind of knew who I was. It vaguely remembered the, the conversation. Oh, he, and he said, "Oh, you're that kid." And I said, "Yeah, I'm the kid." And he said, "Yeah, I think I remember sp speaking to your mother. You, were, you know, you want to try karate?" And I said, "Yeah, I do." So I remember him warning me, saying, look, there's no other kids, so uh, if you do train, you just have to be mindful that um, you're going to be sparring and fighting with men. And to me, that uh, was fine. I've been beaten by, <laughs> by men my whole life. Yeah. So I said, yeah, no worries. I was enthralled. So 
we jumped in, I did the class and I just loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I ran up to him at the end of class, said, that was fantastic. Can I come back? And he said, well, yeah, you can. No worries at all. He said, uh, so it's going to cost, I think it was like $10 a month for this and the uniform is this much. And I'm all, all I'm hearing is I'm not going to get any money to do this. Yeah. Uh, so I raced home that night. I was so excited. By the time I got home, uh, I think my mother was pretty well drunk at that time. Uh, my stepdad wasn't there because he he was driving a taxi at that stage, um, which was kind of good too because he was sober, but yeah. he wasn't there. Um, so I try, I'm trying to relay all this information to my mother and she just told me to shut up and leave, leave her alone and wait till wait till your dad gets home and you can talk, talk, talk about it to him. And, of course, he wasn't home until 3 o'clock in the morning and so my access to him was very, very limited. So it was weeks and weeks and weeks before I was given any type of green green light on it. But in the meantime, I was still up there every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, I wasn't allowed to participate, but I was watching. Uh, I was allowed to do one class. Um, but before, I would still help them to move all the chairs out of the way and help them to clean the floor. And at the end of class, I'd go on, go and talk, talk, talk to everybody, and I was basically the first one there, waiting for the instructor to turn up, and I was the last one to leave because he, where the where the instructor was looking at his clock, saying, "Look, it's eight thirty at night. You should be going going home." Mm -hmm. So I'm leaving now. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, so that's kind of my enthusiasm for it, and it was weeks and weeks and weeks ago on by, and then eventually he came up to me and said, "Look, so." What's going on? Yeah. Are you are you joining or you're not? And I said, well, yeah, but I don't have any money. And he said, okay, no worries at all. He said, so here's what I can do for you. If 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 your mum pays the fees, I'll give you one to buy uniforms, one under my geese. Um, funnily enough, it fit me. Now, when I was that age, that man seemed like he was eight foot tall. Yeah, but he wore a size four gi and. A size four gear. My wife wears a size four gear. I'm not saying that. Not, you know, my original teacher was a small man because he was. He seemed like a big man, but yeah. <laughs> uh, the uniform that he gave me was one of his, and it fit me. And it was a little bit big, but when I look back now, I realise he was actually quite a small bloke, but he had such a massive uh, presence. personality and presence and impact. Yeah, and I remember I raced home with this thing on. And I, I was so proud. And I remember bursting in the door, and I remember as soon as I got in the door, of course, my mum was inebriated, and I remember her just yelling and screaming at me, saying, where did you steal that from? Who did you get this off? I didn't say that you could join, and basically just shot, just shot me down. Yeah. So it started to be a case of I would just sneak away from home. So I would just sneak away, or I wouldn't come home from school. And I just hang around because I went to school in Grovedale as well. And I'd hang around after school for two or two or three hours, hang out with my mates, and then would sneak off to karate. And then right home after that. And the benefit that I had was that my parents didn't know where this school was. Yeah. So they couldn't come up and collect me or chase me down or any, or any, or anything else. It was your safe space, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was absolutely. And I remember the instructor giving me notes to give to my parents. This is how much the fees are. And of course, I would read all those notes. And it was just, you know, he'd, he'd give this itemized list month by month by month how much that she owed us, how much that she owed. Um, but of course, my mother never got those notes. Mm. And so eventually he said, Look, uh, your mum needs to come and sort, sort, sort this out. And I said to him, Look, my mum's got no money. And he said, okay, no worries at all. And I said, uh, but I can wash your car. And he said to me, yeah, look, I drive the dirt road up here, the dirt car park. There's no point washing my car yeah. because the moment I leave here, it's going to be dirty. And I said, well, I'll wash it anyway. And I'll mop the floors and I'll do whatever I have to do. And, um, and he said, okay, all right, look, you can wash my car. Oh. I said, okay. So I would turn up there waiting for him with the bucket because back then 
I was starting to earn some money from washing cars and mowing lawns, just knocking on doors. Mm. So for me, I, I already had the bucket, I already had the sponge. So I would, um, and I had the, I had a hose that I'd stolen from somebody's front lawn. So I would wash his car. As, literally, as soon as he turned up, I'd start washing his car. And I remember him look, looking back at me, shagging his head like, Okay, no worries. It'll be dirty the moment that I drive home again, but all right. So that went on for, for a while. And I think eventually I got down to washing it once a, once a week instead of twi- twice a week um, till eventually he told me not, not to bother wash, washing the car anymore um, and that I could just train. But there were the belt tests as well. And by that, by that stage, I joined the class and then – he asked me if I had any friends who wanted to join. I said, well, absolutely. So I, I then started to go and market it for, for him. So I was at school talking about karate. I was performing it in at school, and all the other kids were enthralled by it. And all of a sudden, there's 10 or 12 kids that are in the class, and they're all from my school. Um, and he said to me, look, do you mind helping me out with a demonstration? I said, yeah, absolutely. So he you know, organised a demonstration at my high school, and then after that, all of a sudden, there's like 30 or 40 kids in there. And he's like saying to me, look, you're going to have to stop telling your friends because it's now become a, a kid's class and we're supposed, this is supposed to be a, a hard man's karate class. And all of a sudden, it's full of kids, um, which I was happy about because I had guys to spar. But then, um, so that's why he said, don't worry about washing the car anymore because you know, you've done enough. But there were the belt tests that had to happen. And I remember all the, every three, three or four months, there was a belt test that, 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 that would happen, but it wouldn't happen in our dojo. It would happen at the main centre, um, which was at the arena in Geelong. Mm. And I would miss out on every single one because th- this went beyond Sensei Vivian's ability to be able to just let me wash his car. This was going to the organisation yeah. and those fees had to be paid. Otherwise, you didn't get to go in to do the test, let alone a couple of weeks later receive a belt. Mm. Um, so all of that stuff had to be paid for. So I never got to to do any of that. So I'd watch all my friends getting graded, 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 and I was the white belt down in the corner all the time, but I was still better than everybody else. But I didn't care. I didn't care about the belts. I didn't care about any of that. Um, and then one day Sensei came up to me with a blue belt, which was two or three belts into the stair system. And by then, you know, all the other kids had started dropping off and there were other kids that are joining that were new. And um, so the original cohort that we had there had died off. Uh, so he gave me this this blue blue belt. And I remember being so proud to wear that. I remember just tie, tying it on in tears. and. Um, it wasn't long after that that I had that issue that I was speaking about with my back and started to flare up and I started to have um, a lot of sciatic nerve pain in my right leg and it was starting to affect the training. And then when I was 16, I ended up having to go into hospital for it. Um, so that kind of put a halt to my training for a while. And was this caused, uh, inflicted from uh, from fighting or from prior all, all the abuse leading up to that? before that prior to it well i don't really know to be honest there was i don't remember a really sharp onset of pain that sort of set anything into motion for that particular injury i just remember having this pain that started was started mild and started to get a little bit worse and a little bit worse and then ended up developing a limp um and then by the time it was sort of considered quite severe uh i was trying to hide it from my mother uh quite successfully too she had not that she that she didn't know notice a lot mm. um i'd be kind of coming home with bruises and everything else um she wouldn't say boo uh and it wasn't until i <laughs> i was actually living on the street i remember being about 15 years old i got because mum used to keep, keep me out a lot and i was living on the street and one of my friend's mothers had seen me limping and said, well, what's, what, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, I'm not exactly sure. So she was the one who took me to Geelong Hospital. They had a bit of a look and said, look, you've got this condition. We need to put you in a hospital. And I ended up staying in there for four or five months. Wow. Well, I was in there for – back then, treatment 
was very, very different to what, to what it is now. Their answer to a disc bulge was to put you in traction. So I was in hospital bed on an angle with my head down here and my feet up here with a belt around my waist with weights attached to it hmm. straight from off the end of the bed. Um, and I had to stay like that for, I basically wasn't allowed out of bed for months. So a lot of muscle wasting. Uh, my legs just got weaker and weaker and weaker and sort of got to the point where by the time I got out of that, um, I couldn't walk well at all. Yeah. And a lot of muscle wasting as well uh, until eventually they said, look, we've got this procedure that we can do which will reduce it. Uh, so I had the surgery and the pain was pretty much gone overnight, which I thought was fantastic. Yeah. So from there I got out of hospital um, tried to go back to training a few times, didn't, didn't really work, but it, I just needed time to recover. And that took maybe two, two, two or three years before I could start to train again. Wow, that long. Mm. So in that time then, your purpose is kind of, what was saving you or had saved you prior was kind of out of your system. You wasn't in your life at the moment. Were you still going to the club and being part of it, even though you couldn't train or did your life go in a different direction? Cause I know you mentioned about the streets. Were you, were you back on mm -hmm. the streets again? Were you committing crimes? Were you back in your old ways or were you still part of the club, but just not participating? Uh, I'd sort of distanced myself from the club a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was like a bit of a self exile and, almost a bit of self-punishment as well. Yeah. Uh, and things became so di difficult that at that point, because I didn't have anywhere to live, um, I didn't want to go back into foster care. I'd sort of been back, backwards and forwards to fo fo foster care a few times. I didn't want to go, go back to that. Um, I just decided to take things into my own hands and I'd rather be on the street than be controlled by somebody else. Um, so yeah, things did change a lot and, uh, the crime stuff started to get a little bit worse. Um, not that I was ever a criminal mastermind or anything else like that. It was, it was all for necessity. Mm. Um, but then, you know, I had some friends that were shoplifting for benefit, not so much for, uh, for purpose. Yeah. Um, so I started to do that as well and, you know, got in trouble with the police a couple, couple of times. I ended up breaking into somebody's home looking for food um, and ended up getting caught for that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it, it did escalate things, uh, but I got a handle on that pretty quickly because I, I didn't want to be a criminal. I didn't want to... Uh, I didn't want to have a lasting impact on my life that I couldn't um, Come call back. myself out of. Yeah. And I was watching friends of mine at that stage start to commit armed robberies and things like that and going away extended per periods of time, and I didn't want that to happen. Of course. Uh, so I had enough self-control to pull myself up. I, I, I knew what danger was. I, I had a very good sense of what, real danger was I knew what I could get away with and I knew what I needed to stop immediately and I knew I knew exactly when to run yeah so that but, kind of saved me a lot whereas a lot of friends who sort of went dark holes drugs alcohol crime I was watching them make those really big mistakes and to me I was baffled because a lot of them were coming from what I perceived was great homes with loving parents who actually fed them and cared about them, didn't beat them up to death. <laughs> so my standard of what was a good home was so skewed that uh, they were going through their own traumas and ended up lashing out, doing these horrible, horrible things. Yeah. But for me, I, c I couldn't understand why they would want to do that considering that their lives were so good. Yeah. Um, but mind you, they knew nothing about what I went through. That that, that was uh, was my secret. That was yeah. nothing to share with anybody. But I feel like you nailed it on the head before. You you'd been on this journey with your martial arts, so you had a form of discipline, right? So you were you were doing what you needed to do in terms of survival. They were doing it as you mentioned before for benefit. 
and they didn't have that they didn't have that discipline in their life. I'm assuming they weren't a part of any martial arts set up at all. No. no they I mean I'm obviously I can't confirm that. I'm just trying to put pieces together and evidence together, but that that's kind of what it feels like to me. You'd been you'd had these years of experience, um, of of commitment and persistence and motivation in terms of the martial arts mixed in with that negative experience and you've gelled it together. Okay, you've been through a bad injury. Um but you got you've got that discipline side of it to it, haven't you? And 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 uh, yeah, that's that's what I was going through my mind when I was listening to you speak. Yeah, wow. So, but I also remember you talking about. Um, I know you uh, you've been through a lot in terms of violence, and then again being training with men. You'd think you'd have quite a lot of confidence and a lot of uh, backbone and a lot of uh, I don't know mental strength around violence. But I remember you saying to me last time about the amount of anxiety that you had around violence as well um yeah, yeah. i mean you think the streets would bring knock that out of you in a way um but it didn't did it no it kind of had the the opposite effect it was just adding to uh my um was adding to the ledger i i, I, I suppose on the streets i kind of found it i was fighting on the streets a lot not so much i wouldn't say i was fighting on the streets what I could say was I was finding myself in altercations with some pretty shitty pe pe people mm. um, because I was in some ugly situations. And I kind of found myself uh, helping to defend my friends. Um, and for what I perceived was, because back then in Geelong, things were pretty rough and we had not so much structured form or gangs or anything else like that, but... Certainly groups from Belmont, groups from Grovedale, groups from Whittington, um, groups from Norlane and Corio, we would all clash. Mm. You'd go down to your local uh, blue light disco and then all of a sudden you've got a group from some somewhere else there. And before you know it, everyone's just starting to punch the crap out of each other. And then there were weapons involved and people start starting to get hurt. So it was it was every one of those was still a, tra a trauma based incident where I was in fear of what it was that was happening around me. I was in fear of what I was becoming if I was uh, uh, giving back what what I was uh, involved with. Um, so I still had I still had a lot of fear in me, and I still had a lot of um, anxiety every time I went anywhere, and every any time anything happened. Uh, and of course, my conscience, every time I would do anything, my conscience would just eat me alive. Anytime I, I stole food, my conscience would eat me alive. Um, so all of that start, started to compound where I started to develop a very sort of serious anxiety problem, which I still deal, deal with today. Even just this interview alone, I suppose, is enough. Um, so Sorry. it's still one of those things where I, it, it never, ever goes away. It never... Yeah. It never stops. And I suppose what I'm learning to do now, I'm 50 years old and I'm still learning how to cope on a daily basis and how to um, how to learn to live with what I've had and what I've done and what I've seen uh, and trying not to let it control me. Yeah. And that's still a daily battle. And I think for anyone in my position, I'm not trying to say that I'm, know anything more than anybody else um but i guess what i've learned is that it's one of those things that never goes away and it's something that you have to work on daily and if you don't work on it daily if i don't work on it today tomorrow's going to get me and that's kind of how close around the corner it actually is yeah and how close things are to um which almost seems like how clo close things are to being taken away and I suppose that's the fear that I live with every day now is is that things could just in a snap be gone and everything that I've worked for could be gone. Um, the reality is is that, is that it would take a, a lot for things to just go away, but that immediate anxiety of things are going to disappear lives with me all the time. That's something that I have to control. That's something that I have to uh, work on daily and I need to be mindful of all the time. 
Yeah, I have to agree. Um, dealing with anxiety, that's something I suffered with for quite a while. And um, you're right, it is a daily battle. I think we have to set, and that's why I think I asked you at the beginning about how do you set up yourself mentally every day because it is a it is a battle i don't think you can completely conquer it maybe you can i don't know but I'd, uh, I, there are times that i sometimes i found myself sweating in certain moments but i if you look back to what i suffered with anxiety a few years ago you know i was i was dripping in sweat at the thought of something fear of unknown approval fear of judgment and i do think i'm a really good level where not the point that i don't care what people think but a really healthy level of all right well you think that that's okay. Um, you know what I mean? And you're right, it's a daily battle and there are things that I do to set myself up. And then sometimes I don't do it and I self-reflect and go, oh, I can see the power in why I do it now and, and I need to keep doing it. But I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, so it is, so what would, I know the turning point in my life and how, what, what I did. Um, what happened for you? What was your pivotal change in your life to to help you on a daily basis? Or was it physical, mental? Was it connection, relationships? What, what what changed for you? I think what changed everything for me was when I met my wife. Uh, she was actually going out with a with a fella. <laughs> um, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it was certainly very honourable. Okay. Um, he was a guy that that I I I was working. Um, at a company where we used to door to door sell alarms. Um, now, through my uh, life experience, I was always able to sell things. I, I could sell anything. <laughs> um, so I, I, I started working door to door sales, uh, selling these stupid little alarm clocks to go, uh, sorry, alarm systems to go up, go up and walk. So I'd met him and I'd sort of given him a, like a little bit of. Or what my life was about, and it wasn't enough, enough for him to be ooh and ah and, and, and everything else. And then I finally met his girlfriend, who had, you know, he dated her for maybe 12, 12 months or so. They hadn't lived together or anything else like that. Um, I remember when I walked in and I met her, because I knew him, and then I met this lovely young lady, and I remember thinking to myself, why on earth is she with him? Because she's way too good for him. She's certainly way too good for the likes of, of me and, and, and of him. I remember I saw her eyes and I was just, and she was just, she was just so kind. And because back then I, I, my physical training had sort of step, stepped up. I was doing a lot of bodybuilding and, you know, had tattoos and all that stuff and the shaved head and all that stuff and young, uh, and I would be judged for that by most everybody. And I remember she was the first person I ever remember would looked at me and didn't expect me just to have this rough backstory and, and or a rough facade. Yeah. Because that was kind of what I got from him was, you know, I was his tough, rough mate. And I remember the first time I met her, how kind she was. And that stayed with me. And it was kind of funny because that gave me a, Gave me a clue that I was actually that I could actually be worth some something that I was more than just you know this kid had been beat about and uh, had fought back. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first met her, I was with my girlfriend at the time, who we were having all sorts of issues, and and obviously we were young, you know, both young and stupid. Um, clearly not in love or anything else like that. And then a little while after, I'd, I'd been single again for a while, and then I called up this, their, this mate of mine. I said, mate, how are you going? I said, look, I'm actually going to move to Sydney. I, I've had enough of it here, here, here in Victoria. I want to go back to Sydney because that, well, that was where I was from originally. My brother had moved back up there, um, so I thought I, I need a clean, clean break. And I said, but I need some, somewhere to stay for a couple of days because, you know, I, I can't stay with my family here. Mm. And he said, yeah, no worries at all. Come by my place. Um, I've got a place over at East Geelong. Come, come on by. And I said, no worries at all. So I remember Paul put up at the front and I walked in the door and I was greeted by him and I was greeted by his girlfriend, Fleur, who was my now wife. 
And I remember, again, just how kind she was, how, how just amazingly beautiful she was, but just her kindness and the way that she accepted me. And he's called me, and, oh, g'day, mate, how you going? Good here, have a beer. How long do you need to stay for? I said, look, I'm going to leave on Monday. And this was on Friday night. And I never left. Um, and I moved into the spare bedroom, and then within a couple of days, um, this Fleur was staying at her fair sister's place around the corner. She was, she had moved in with him, but they weren't getting along very well, so she'd actually moved into her sister's place around the corner. Um, and her sister, I hadn't met her before, but she, I met her too, and I just couldn't believe that there's people out there who are actually kind and loving. Mm. Um, so I moved, we, we were staying there, and then by the Monday, I realised that um, I didn't want to go to Sydney, that it was a bad idea. And Andrew had decided that the, the boyfriend that um, that he was going to move back to Bendigo, and and so we sort of struck an arrangement where I'd take over the lease. Mm. I said, "Yep, no worries at all." So I did. And then Flora and I started to talk. I was going around to see her every day at her sister's place, and and um, we just started to get along better and better and better. And then I, the the idea struck me that what if I was actually good enough to be somebody to her. Um, so over the course of maybe three or four months, we started to develop our, our, our relationship. And then we kind of both quick, we realised that we were deeply in love. Mm. And I didn't know how, how the hell that happened. Um, but she was the first person who was actually kind, who cared, and would uh, who didn't care about my tattoos and didn't care about my physicality and didn't care about anything other than uh, what she could see from when, from when we spoke. Mm. And then I met her sisters and, and all of them were just incredible. And then I met her mum. And I remember we went round to her mother's place and she was in Grovedale and I walked in the door and she said to me, she said, when are you going to marry my daughter? And I was sort of stunned and she had four daughters and they were all single. And I said, which one? Which one are you referring to? She goes, you know, don't be silly. She goes, I can see that you're in love with Fleur. And I said to her, no, I'm not. And she just laughed. She said, oh, yeah, okay. Anyway, through conversations with her mum, Jenny, who, is, who ended up sort of becoming my mum, she had said to me very early on, she said, um, I don't know what she was, psychic or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm not a believer in any of that sort of thing, but she said to me, one day you're going to become a teacher and you're going to teach pe pe people and, you, and, you, and, they, and they're going to learn some of the most important life skills that they could ever hope to learn from you. And I was sort of enthralled. She said, and you're going to marry Fleur. And I kind of didn't believe it. And within two years, Fleur and I were married. Um, and that was a moment of my life where I knew that I was worth something, that I, that I could be something, that I, was, that I was wanted, that I was needed, that I was respected. And there were people out there who actually cared and that were actually um, had this thing on in here called a heart. Um, and her whole family kind of rallied behind me and they all knew, all knew about my story because Fleur and I had sort of gone in depth um, to a lot of the things that I'd gone through and they all accepted me and I couldn't believe it. And, but at the same time, I knew that I deserved to be loved and I knew that I deserved to be happy. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to be putting on my uh, put, putting my life on to anybody either. I didn't want anyone else to suffer. I didn't want anyone else to be dragged down, I suppose, by what I'd been through. So I was still very hesitant, but as hesitant as, as I was, I was, I was hesitant on one side, but like a steam train on the other. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't run towards it far, fast enough. Mm. And that moment was... 
a pivotal point where I'd lived, I think I was 23 when we got together. I was 25 when we got married. It's kind of funny. I've just celebrated my 50th birthday. And the hallmark of that was that there was uh, life before Fleur and and after Fleur. Mm. And my life before Fleur was, um, although it it wasn't all bad, but it was all trauma, abuse and neglect and survival. And and all of a sudden I switched to this thrive mode Mm. where from the moment that, I mean, mind you, we were absolutely dirt poor, but we started something and we started to build something together and life just seemed like it, it couldn't get any better. Um, mind you, I mean, I've, I've still gone through ups and downs emotionally and everything else, but the mm. stable thing that's always been there for the last 25 years or 27 years now really was Fleur. Yeah. And she had offered something in spades that I'd never had before. And I couldn't understand it in the beginning. I just couldn't understand how lucky I'd become. I couldn't, I couldn't grasp how, how different the contrast was. Um, and even just, just reflecting upon it now, uh, to see what things were previously to what they are now, it's such a tra- transformation. And it certainly is. To, to see how far I've come, and, and she has supported me through some of the most stupid endeavours, but some of the most important decisions that I've ever had to make in my life, um, she's been there for me, and yeah. she has continued to be there for me. And I was saying before when we were speaking about the at the start, how do you mentally prep yourself for each day? Um, well, it was the one who instigated that. Uh, mindful exercise to stop think what's real what's not Mm. how to stay settle into things um how to put aside what is going to trigger and how to concentrate on what's going to help me to grow she was the one who taught me how to do that um at that stage she was still a young woman she hadn't become a nurse yet she um let alone gotten into the mental health side of things. I, th- I think I was her inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I reckon so. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So when she finally became a mental health nurse, you know, she was highly overqualified because she had to deal with me for 20 odd years. But a great um, study case, right? Case study. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But I think what she pointed out to me and what she wanted me to understand more was not only did I survive all of that, which was against all odds. When, when I look back today, um, my brother and sister who had gone through all of that with me, um, they didn't make it. They didn't make it, but I did. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.